In the mid-1950s, rock and roll legend Elvis Presley's flamboyant dance moves were perceived by some as sexually suggestive, and his performances were frequently branded as obscene and vulgar. Even his records were proclaimed by some preachers as the devil's music. The obscenity and vulgarity. Presley himself always rejected the claim that he was being sexually elusive on purpose and always defended his gyrations, stating that he simply got into the feel of the rhythm and jumped around the way he did because he enjoyed it. Nevertheless, he was often reprimanded by local municipalities and even the police force. He was also infamously filmed from the waist up for the majority of his appearances on The Ed Sullivan Show. Rock and roll pioneer Lil Richard, however, knew full well of the graphic nature of his music and embraced it. Good golly Miss Molly, sure like to ball. When you're a rockin' and a rollin', can't hear your mama call. The phrase rockin' and rolling, as featured in the song, was a slang expression for sexual intercourse and indeed was the basis of the term rock and roll itself. Rock and roll has got to go. This sexualistic, up-tempo genre of music caused a stir amongst those of a more conservative predisposition who were up in arms about the possible detrimental effects that the music might have on its young, impressionable audience. It is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. Despite criticisms, rock and roll lived on and the issue of immoral lyrics and unchristian music continued into the 60s and 70s. Beyond just increasingly sexualized content, new, other controversial themes began to be expressed, such as occultism, violence, and substance abuse, sometimes inspired by the personal experiences of the artists themselves. The 1980s ushered in an era of music consumption propagated by MTV, a television channel that showcased music videos of current day artists, which proved to blur the perceptive distinction between the audio and the visuals of music. You'll never look at music the same way again. Thusly, the suggestive nature of some music successfully made the transition into video form. The heavy metal genre also began growing in popularity, the lyrics of which regularly addressed darker themes such as death and violence in addition to sex. Just as rock and roll was demonized in the 50s, so was heavy metal and MTV in the 80s, with more and more artists freely expressing themselves in more and more explicit ways with minimal restrictions. A small group of politically connected women decided to group together and do their part to protect children from the allegedly harmful music of the 1980s. This is the story of how an association of politicians' wives, for better or worse, forever changed the landscape of the music industry. One day in 1984, Mary Elizabeth Gore, better known as Tipper Gore, wife of Senator Albert Gore, bought the major hit record Purple Rain by Prince for her then 11-year-old daughter, Karenna. They listened to it together and enjoyed the album, up until the track entitled Darling Nikki. The song opened with the lyrics, I knew a girl named Nikki. You could say she was a sex fiend. I met her in a hotel lobby, masturbating with a magazine. Tipper Gore was shocked and appalled by the lyrics and felt that this kind of music was highly inappropriate for her child. She went back to the record store in an attempt to return the album, but the retailer informed her that the record couldn't be returned on the count that it was already opened and played. Freelance journalist Candy Stroud also had a similar experience when she listened to Darling Nikki with her then 15-year-old daughter. At around the same time, Susan Baker, wife of White House Chief of Staff James Baker, was questioned by her 7-year-old daughter about the lyrical content of Madonna's hit single like a virgin. This led Baker to examine the current state of pop music, who before this uncomfortable encounter was not aware that such arguably inappropriate media was so readily available and consumable by her child. Tipper Gore also began doing some research of her own on modern day music and educated herself on the content of MTV. She claimed that the music and videos to which she was exposed frightened her and would undoubtedly frighten children as well. In early 1985, she got in contact with Susan Baker, 
and other alarmed mothers who have had similar experiences, namely Pamela Hauer, wife of powerful Washington realtor Raymond Hauer, and Sally Nevius, wife of Washington City Council Chairman John Nevius. They soon came to be referred to as the Washington Wives due to their husband's government connections in the Washington, D.C. area. They all shared the concern that parents are oftentimes unaware of the kind of music to which their children listen and discussed the possible introduction of a rating system, similar to the movie rating scheme utilized by the Motion Picture Association of America to increase consumer awareness. The small but ambitious group soon acquired the support of Beach Boys member Mike Love and around April, they received a $5,000 grant from Mike Love's Love Foundation to further their efforts. They were also financially assisted by Joseph Coors, owner of Coors Beer. He even provided them with office space. On May 13, 1985, under the presidency of Pam Hauer, the Washington Wives and close to 20 other participants, most of whom other women tied to Washington, formally formed the Parents Music Resource Center, a nonprofit tax exempt organization whose mission statement was to raise parental awareness of the growing trend in music towards lyrics that are sexually explicit, excessively violent, or glorify the use of drugs and alcohol. But as parents, we believe we have a right to some consumer guidance in our effort to protect our own children from material that we believe may be inappropriate for them. The PMRC wasted no time to raise awareness, as on the day the organization was founded, PMRC affiliate Edward Fritz, president of the National Association of Broadcasters, sent letters to over 4,000 radio and TV stations, warning them about pornographic lyrics in the hopes that they would in turn encourage record labels to provide radio and TV broadcasters with the lyrics of the music they would be transmitting, and implied that their licenses would be revoked if they broadcast songs with explicit lyrics. We're trying to tell the owners and the managers of these various broadcast properties to be sensitive to the music that their program directors and disc jockeys were playing. The PMRC also received logistical support from religious organizations such as Teen Vision, TV evangelist Pat Robertson's 700 Club, and the Religious Booksellers Convention. The Washington Wives denied any religious connection with these groups. In addition, PMRC affiliate Reverend Jeff Ling a self-confessed rock music aficionado and musician contributed to the group's efforts to publish a monthly newsletter. Other affiliates of the group soon included several U.S. Senators and Congressmen. Journalist Candy Stroud would prove to serve as the center's spokesperson. With regard to the suggested music rating system, the PMRC devised their own symbols depending on the subject matter of the lyrics. X for profane or sexually explicit, V for violence, D slash A for advocacy of drugs or alcohol, and O for occult content. As the PMRC were a non-profit organization, they could not lobby for government-mandated rating system legislation, and instead had to urge record companies to voluntarily apply rating stickers on their albums. Consequently, the Parents Music Resource Center formed an alliance with the 5.6 million member National Parent Teacher Association which had already been strongly encouraging the introduction of a music rating system for several years. To better highlight the extremities of obscenity, the PMRC made public a list of 15 songs which they singled out as being the most graphically obscene examples of modern music, the conveniently alliterated Filthy 15. The 15 songs chosen were a rather peculiar array of popular hit singles and obscure heavy metal tracks. All of the songs were given ratings based on the PMRC's rating scheme. Featured on the list was the often quoted Darling Nikki by Prince, which, despite its infamy amongst PMRC aficionados, was not a widely played song on the radio. The list also included the hit song Sugar Walls, written and produced by Prince and performed by Sheena Easton, with the title and subject matter of which undoubtedly euphemistically alluding to her vaginal cavity. Rock bands Judas Priest, Motley Crue, Def Leppard, and ACDC were also targeted by the PMRC. Rock band Twisted Sisters' rebellious anthem, We're Not Gonna Take It, was included on the list due to its alleged advocacy of violence. It soon became apparent that the PMRC were also targeting controversial videos and artwork, 
in addition to lyric content. It saddens me to see that these people can't see the humor. I mean, they can't see the cartoonishness of the whole thing. I mean, our main character is thrown out a window and he gets up and brushes himself off and he goes back for more. He's blown up with a hand grenade in a swimming pool and the next scene, he's not even wet. This is a cartoon. Warner Brothers, Roadrunner, Bugs Bunny, Mickey Mouse has been doing this kind of violence for years. And we're the number one most violent band. I think they should crack down on Walt Disney. Heavy metal group Wasp's 1984 single, Animal, F*** Like a Beast, was included on the list due to its graphically sexual lyrics and for the fact that the single sleeve art depicted a circular saw blade running through a man's bicot pieced crotch region. Lead singer Blackie Lawless would also perform live wearing similar attire. I got this glint in my eye whenever I'm performing, which keeps people off balance where they're asking, is he or isn't he serious about this? Those people have obviously never seen that glint. I mean, how can any grown man walk around with a 12-inch saw blade between his legs and take that seriously? Though pop stars Madonna and Cyndi Lauper were also featured on the list, nine of the 15 filthy songs belonged to the rock umbrella genre. In Tipper Gore's 1987 book, Raising PG Kids in an X-Rated Society, she claimed that young white males were most at risk of suicide. She also made the tentative connection that white males were also the primary audience for heavy metal. The artist singled out by the PMRC received much attention, and the center's strong disdain for heavy metal may have even contributed to its surge in popularity in the 1980s. However, Blackie Lawless later confessed that even though Wasp's inclusion in the Filthy 15 made them a household name, their newly found infamy did not result in a noticeable increase in record sales. Around late May, the PMRC sent a letter to over 60 record companies and to the Record Industry Association of America, which represented record labels that were responsible for approximately 85% of all music sales in the country. The PMRC letter addressed the concerns they had about the troublesome nature of modern music and included their proposed rating system. They claimed that the graphic nature of modern music, especially rock music, directly correlated with the rise of certain crimes. According to the Parents Music Resource Center, increasingly graphic music content correlated with a 7% increase in rapes and an over 300% rise in the rate of teenage suicides. In addition, the center had other demands. They requested that the rating scheme would also apply to live shows and music videos. And if record companies did not agree with the voluntary labeling of their albums, they should instead reconsider their contracts with performers known to release material with troublesome imagery and or lyrics. Susan Baker called this action voluntary self-restraint. The PMRC also requested that records with obscene album artwork be kept under the counters of record stores and that all albums would be sold with attached lyric sheets. When accused of censorship, the PMRC vehemently denied it. As Baker stated, Pornography sold to children is illegal. Enforcing that is not censorship. It is simply the act of a responsible society that recognizes that some material made available to adults is not appropriate for children. We are not talking about banning or censoring the content. As graphic and as violent as it can be, uh, I would defend its right to exist. However, this material is being aggressively marketed to younger and younger children, preteens and young teens, and they're being exposed to what I would call mature themes, sadomasochism, thrill killing, songs glorifying incest, and songs glorifying rape. This letter was signed by the wives of over 20 politicians and businessmen. Out of all the record companies who received it, only seven replied all of whom proclaiming strong opposition to the PMRC's demands. The RIAA also initially refused to take any action, citing the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, which supported the free exercise of speech and music. However, on August 5, 1985, President of the RIAA, Stanley Gordikoff, wrote a letter to the PMRC president, Pam Hauer, stating that he had agreed to issue all future albums with explicit content with a voluntarily applied general sticker that read, Parental Guidance, Explicit Lyrics. He refused to give in to any of their other demands. Independent musician and cultural icon Frank Zappa, who was strongly in favor of freedom of expression and touted himself as a constitutional fundamentalist, wrote an open letter to the music industry 
which was published in the music trade magazine Cashbox. In the letter, he wholeheartedly disagreed with Gordikov's decision to go forth with the stickering plan, and implied that there was a hidden motive behind his reasoning. As the title of the open letter suggested, it was extortion, pure and simple. The PMRC were not just an independent committee of concerned parents. They were familiarly connected to the US Senate and House of Representatives, whose approval the RIAA desperately needed to pass the Home Audio Recording Act known as H.R. 2911 in the House of Representatives and as the Matthias Bill in the Senate, and better known as the Blank Tape Tax. If approved, this bill would add a tax of one cent per minute on all blank audio cassette tapes sold, and an additional 5 to 25 percent tax on all home tape recorders in order to help alleviate the massive financial losses created by music pirating and home recording. Due to the nature of this bill, the proceeds from the tax would be distributed to the record manufacturers and record publishers, and would not benefit the artists in any way. As it happened, the head of the committee which would oversee the legislation was Senator Strom Thurmond, whose wife, Nancy Janice Moore, was an affiliate of the PMRC. Zappa suggested that Gordikov felt that he had to agree to what he dubbed the conception of an appeasement sticker in order to appease the Washington wives and their husbands so that they would in turn grant record labels the blank tape tax at the expense of performers. Zappa continues, If you are an artist reading this, think for a moment. Did anyone ask you if you wanted to have the stigma of potential filth plopped onto your next release via this appeasement sticker? If you are a songwriter, did anyone ask you if you wanted to spend the rest of your career modifying your lyric content to suit the spiritual needs of an imaginary 11-year-old? The answer is, obviously, no. In all of this, the main concern has been the business agenda of the major labels versus the egos and sexual neuroses of these vigilant ladies. A record company has the right to conduct its business and to make a profit, but not at the expense of the people who make the product possible. Someone still has to write and perform the music. The RIAA has taken what I feel to be a short-sighted approach to the issue. The voluntary sticker will not appease these creatures, nor will it grease the chute through the Thurmond Committee. There are no promises or guarantees here, only threats and insinuations from the PMRC. Gordikov's decision was largely unwelcome by the record industry. Nevertheless, under pressure from the RIAA, the majority of record labels agreed to the proposal, with the exception of A&M, MCA, Geffen Records, and other smaller labels. President of Gold Mountain Records, Danny Goldberg, founded a coalition of music industry managers and music artists who were against the RIAA's labeling initiative, called Musical Majority, a pun referring to the Republican Christian political group, Moral Majority. I empathize with parents who want to have influence over what their children hear. But the rating of records by some committee that would, by its nature, have to be arbitrary and subjective is not the proper solution to this problem. The PMRC, on the other hand, did not feel Gordikov's idea of a warning label system was sufficient, and insisted on pushing ahead with the idea of a specialized rating system. They also requested that a dedicated panel be conceived to develop guidelines and ensure uniform application of the ratings. Gordikov contended that such a scheme involving a designated committee judging the explicitness of records was not possible and simply stated that explicit is explicit. Despite near universal opposition to the warning stickers, this was not an unheard of idea. Before the PMRC and the National PTA began demanding for universal music labeling, there have been a select few artists who had released some of their albums with special affixed warning stickers. Placing stickers informing consumers of foul and or offensive language was a fairly common practice on comedy albums and were utilized on releases by stand-up comedians such as Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor. In fact, a year before the inception of the PMRC, Frank Zappa himself began releasing albums on his own Barking Pumpkin record label with his own warning guarantee, which as well as referencing the content of the album also criticized televangelists who had been gaining substantial popularity throughout the 1980s. 
This album contains material which a truly free society would neither fear nor suspress. In some socially retarded areas, religious fanatics and ultra-conservative political organizations violate your First Amendment rights by attempting to censor rock and roll albums. We feel this is unconstitutional and un-American. As an alternative to these government-supported programs designed to keep you docile and ignorant, Barking Pumpkin is pleased to provide stimulating digital audio entertainment for those of you who have outgrown the ordinary. The language and concepts contained herein are guaranteed not to cause eternal torment in the place where the guy with the horns and the pointed stick conducts his business. This guarantee is as real as the threats of the video fundamentalists who use attacks on rock music in their attempt to transform America into a nation of check-mailing nincompoops in the name of Jesus Christ. If there is a hell, its fires wait for them, not us. Much of Frank Zappa's back catalog discusses controversial topics and contains obscene lyrics. His 1984 album, Thing Fish, in particular, features lyrics that are arguably more sexually explicit than anything found on the Filthy 15. But for the moment, at least, Frank was spared from the PMRC's firing line. Within a very short span of time, the PMRC's topics of discussion permeated mainstream television and news segments. And in no time at all, the PMRC had a villain, Porn Rock. Sex shooter, shoot love in your direction. We think this subject matter is totally inappropriate, and that's why we're making a fuss. It is like going to a porno movie and uh, seeing everything, only it's a porno hearing session and the kids are hearing everything. We just want people to know what's going on. And we have asked the music industry, please rate these albums so we can protect our young children from trash like this. I'm very concerned that, that uh, you know, we're talking about some form of censorship here, which I absolutely do not believe in. A recent hit of Sheena Easton's called Sugar Walls about sexual arousal was yanked from several radio stations. Elvis swung his hips, but he said, I want you, I need you, I love you. It was somewhat romantic, the themes of his songs. Sheena Easton sings, come inside my sugar walls. Artists are just saying, hey, might not get off a case. This is what art's all about, it's being free. And if you don't like it, then turn into something else. You know, like, go watch the news and watch violence if you don't like sexuality. I'm not saying that I admire most of these lyrics. Journalist Nat Hinton, a passionate civil libertarian. Uh, many of them are, are, are not songs at all. They're just words thrown against the wall. And some of them are kind of disgusting. But who's supposed to decide? Who's, who draws the line? I met her in a hotel lobby masturbating with a magazine. Not a woman but a whore. I can taste the hate. Well, now I'm killing you. Watch your face turning blue. Come on, slap my face the way you gag me, the way you give me pain. People are not realizing that their children are being exposed to really what are very mature themes, maybe what you'd even expect uh, in, in strip joints, in burlesque shows. It is very likely that the story was further pushed due to the alluring lasciviousness of raunchy music videos, which served as visual aids. We're about to play some music videos with lyrics you might find offensive or you might not want your children to hear. We have left out some of the most offensive material, but what's been left in, if John Denver and Frank Sinatra are your speed, is still likely to curl your hair. Here on videotape are some examples of what drives moms and dads up the wall. Is that too far? What well, we're talking about here are some studies that show that more and more rock videos are loaded with the scenes depicting drug use, casual sex, and that an entire generation of kids could grow up thinking that violence, sadism, degrading sex, and, um, and drugs are okay. If there is to be censorship, then it should be in the home, and that's where it should start, and that's where it should end. But the kids will tell you the parents can't be everywhere. I don't think the mother can stop the child from listening to the radio or watching TV. Why should they, you know, put a limit to what I want to listen to? It's a free country. We can do whatever we want to do. My parents, like, don't, don't like, they don't like me listening to the music, but I, I'm, I explain to them that it's like just normal music. Some women like violent sex, and I think that they have a right to hear about it. 
Frank Zappa is one of the few rock artists to come out openly against the labeling effort. I mean, if it looks like censorship and it smells like censorship, it is censorship, no matter whose wife is talking about it. It's censorship. These right-wing people have this fetish about the right to life. What about the right to the life of an unborn idea? How much are you going to miss out on the United States if you won't let people think, say what they think, and do something about it so that people who don't think and are too busy doing something else can have the benefit of the people who think. Frank Zappa became a very vocal critic of the proposed stickering scheme and made numerous appearances on radio and TV, participating in news reports and televised debates. Is there anything at all that uh, you would not want to have either in music video or on records? Is there any line that you wouldn't want to see crossed, uh, perhaps that your children might be exposed to? Well, I believe that a child uh, deserves a good sexual education, and matters pertaining to sex should not be kept from children, because if you keep them sexually ignorant, you make them vulnerable, vulnerable to child molesters. And I think it's important that children learn as soon as they're capable of understanding, with the assistance of a parent, they should know about sex and they should be prepared to deal with it. On August 20th, Frank Zappa appeared on CNN's Larry King Live to discuss the PMRC's activities against obscene music and other related topics. Basically, the rock and roll industry is a business that sells whatever product they can sell. And it's the law of supply and demand. If somebody wants to hear a record that says, let's go sniff cocaine, they're going to buy it because they are sniffing cocaine. The How do you record, feel about that? Though? I don't like it. I'm not consuming it. You know, I think that it's, it's not for me. But I wouldn't deny somebody else the right to hear it. I think of it as music. Uh, an adult society has to do with regard to children? Sure. They should protect the welfare of the children. And one of the things that you do for a child is prepare that child for the real world by giving it the type of information it needs in order to deal with the real world. So that when they hear Let's Sniff Coke, they don't go out and sniff That's it. That's right. Because they've been prepared right, not because the record right. told them to do it. Right. In a pre-recorded debate, which was broadcast on August 25th, he appeared on CBS's Night Match, hosted by Charlie Rose, in which he faced off PMRC spokesperson Candy Stroud. I have three children and I believe that they should be protected from violent and pornographic rock and that it is the responsibility of the music industry to reform itself. Arguing against the resolution, singer, songwriter, one of the more unorthodox performers of rock and roll and the father of four children, Frank Zappa. Frogwash, I say. Censorship is bad for you and sex is good for you. <laughs> really? <laughs> In the 50s, Elvis Presley sang, I want you, I need you, I love you, or come along and be my teddy bear. Now, uh, Mor Morris Day in the Times sings, if the kid can't make you come, nobody can. I want to get you off, baby. What does it take to get you off? I feel sorry for her that anybody could respond that way to matters pertaining to sex. I don't really have a statement to make about this because I need to know more about what it is you're really trying to say because it's not very clear. You've quoted from songs, but you don't say exactly what it is about these quotations that are so offensive to you. What uh, well, to answer your question, Frank, I think that sex is healthy, but it's not an animal act. <clears throat> In the heavy metal industry, for example, um, where you have songs that uh, deal with uh, forcing a woman to have oral sex at gunpoint, as in uh, Judas Priest on the album Defenders of the Faith, uh, Eat Me Alive, which, uh, in which he sings, sounds like an animal panting to the beat, groan in the pleasure zone, gasping from the heat, gut-wrenching frenzy that deranges every joint. I'm going to force you at gunpoint to eat me alive. Okay, I can see why some of this stuff rubs you the wrong way, because you have a problem with sex. The lyrics that you're talking about contain some words that seem to trigger this peculiar response. I see there's nothing wrong with sex, but there is something wrong with preaching incest, masturbation, and a casual yeah. attitude towards sex to teenagers. What's wrong with masturbation? Let me pick the <laughs> this time for a break, and we'll be right back. Stroud heavily relied on reciting controversial lyrics to enforce her argument knowingly in front of children in attendance in the studio. Love is not Prince singing, if your man ain't no good, come on over to my neighborhood, jump in the sack and I'll jack you off. She, for an hour, recited the lyrics to every song that talked about masturbation, giving head at gunpoint, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff, without, I believe, without publishing clearance from the groups in question, you know, which I don't think is very fair. I, uh... I'm glad that you're very unorthodox because a lot of the lyrics are perverted sex. They're not normal. I think the parents would like to know that some of those things are not normal, 
sexual relations. Yes, but that doesn't mean that you have to do them. You should know about them. Information doesn't kill children you. Children don't know the difference. Children learn, children learn the difference by receiving information, which they can store and sort with your help as a parent. If you don't let them know about this stuff, they'll grow up and be ignorant. I would rather have them be ignorant of something. Anybody who chooses to have their children be ignorant is making a mistake because then they can be victims. They have to know. The show was supposed to be a one-hour debate, and it was done in front of a live audience, and we had uh, conversations with the audience, and the show uh, was taped uh, a week in advance, but they held the show back for a week, and they cut out most of what I said, and the show wound up being maybe about a half an hour long, and the whole structure of the show was changed, and I thought, wait a minute, somebody doesn't want to hear what I got to say here. And I started doing some checking, and I got really mad. It was soon decided that the issue would be discussed in a Senate hearing, and Zappa wanted to get involved, even though he felt that it was a waste of resources and expenses. The committee hearing in front of the Senate Commerce, Science and Transportation Committee, I believe, was put there for one reason, because on that committee, they had five husbands of the different ladies who had signed the original PMRC demands of the record company. Now, I think there's a conflict of interest in that. I think that it's, um, it's more like a Soviet Union show trial to do a thing like that. If it's supposed to be a fact-finding committee and sitting on the committee, you already have husbands of people who are connected with the group that is bringing the issue before the public. Alongside Zappa, two other performers decided to take part in the Senate hearing. Singer-songwriter John Denver known for his international humanitarian work, who most people thought would come out in support of the PMRC's proposals, and Dee Snyder of Twisted Sister, the only person featured in the Filthy 15 to agree to testify. On September 13th, one week before his scheduled appearance before the Senate, Zappa participated in a debate on ABC's Nightline, hosted by Ted Koppel, accompanied by singer Donny Osmond, and once again by Candy Stroud. Kids go after what's cool. They're going to go to an R-rated movie before they go to a, a PG over a G, because it's cool. And if you censor it, it's going to be more cool to buy the uh, hardcore lyrics. The room that I was sitting in had this white rag on the wall. It was somebody's office, and Donny Osmond was in the hall with the presidential blue background. Candy Stroud was in Washington, D.C. with a bookcase behind her. You know, like, she's the real world with these two criminals over on the West Coast. I this is an issue that will to... break families apart as they argue over the rating of the album. That's why it's absolutely <laughs> terrible. This is an anti-family issue. I don't think... They had filtered my microphone to make me sound like Billy Barty. They really had to figure out who was going to be the bad guy, who's the clean guy, and who's the right person. I'll tell you what, Frank, I, you, you're an intelligent man who makes some good points. Make them. Let's not start name-calling. Think of this. Suppose you go on Nightline and Ted Koppel says to you twice in the show, Well, Mr. Zappa, you're an intelligent man. Isn't that the equivalent of putting the pointed white paper hat on your head you know, twice in one show? I, I realize you've spent a good deal of your professional life enjoying outraging people. That's all right. There's a, there's a useful role for it. You've done it in a very entertaining way. And you're a very intelligent man. Is there any way, however... In a similar vein as in her previous debate, Candy Stroud featured the works of several controversial artists, effectively giving them free airtime. I F U C K like a beast, animal. And, and is this the kind of album that you want your child to come home with? No. What about Motley Crue? Motley Crue, not a woman, but a whore. Right, I can Candy, taste I'll, the I'll tell you what. I think we got the idea, and we've had enough examples of it during the course of it. We know what. On September nineteenth, nineteen eighty-five. The so-called airing of the issue was held before the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science and Transportation. You know what worries me about what's happening here today? This is government as entertainment. These people have plenty to do besides talking about whether or not somebody's little Johnny gets to see the Blackie Lawless cover with a buzzsaw blade between his legs. Among those testifying were some of the more prominent representatives of the PMRC, including Tipper Gore, Susan Baker and Reverend Jeff Ling and three musicians, Frank Zappa, John Denver, and Dee Snyder. The reason for this hearing is not to promote any legislation. Indeed, I don't know of any suggestion that any legislation be passed, but to simply provide a forum for airing the issue itself, for ventilating the issue, for bringing it out in the public domain. With respect to the content of the statements, uh, to describe what's in the music that's in question 
will, I'm sure, require some witnesses to use words and describe things that will shock the sensitivities of many of us in this room and many who are watching these proceedings on television. And I just wanted to warn you of that in advance so that if children have the TV on, they can, uh, or their parents can know what's, what's in store for them. Due to the high profile of some of the witnesses present, the venue was filled to above capacity. Senator Hollings. In defiance of Senator Danforth's previous statements, Senator Fritz Hollings implied that he was interested in introducing legislation. But in all candor, I would tell you it's, it's outrageous filth. Uh, and we've got to do something about it. And that if I could find some way constitutionally to do away with it, I would. The mere announcement of this hearing led to cries of censorship. The issue before us, however, is not censorship. The labeling of offensive lyrics and other efforts aimed at encouraging restraint regarding the time, place, and manner of certain speech in question. That does not constitute censorship. I believe this may well be the most important hearing conducted by the Commerce Committee this year. The kind of material in question is really very different from the kind of material which has caused uh, similar controversies in past generations. And I think uh, those who have not become familiar with this material will, will realize that fact when they, when they see some of the examples that involve extremely popular groups that get an awful lot uh, of play, some of the most popular groups around now. The first witness is uh, Senator Paula Hawkins, who has joined us at the committee's uh, desk. Senator Hawkins, delighted to have you here. Much has changed since Elvis' seemingly innocent times. The record album covers, to me, are self-explanatory. And I'd like to show just a sampling of a record cover. Hmm? Pyromania, no question. Burn a building, burn, burn, burn. When do you win? Porn rock. Porn rock. I, it's my life, and I love sex. With obviously a lot of fire and chains and other objectionable tools of gratification in some twisted minds. One criticism of the rock industry is the way it portrays values in rock videos, which are viewed by the kids, while we're all busy here being legislators. I brought along two videos from which to choose. She proceeded to show the music video for Hot for Teacher by Van Halen, up until the guitar solo portion. That video. No, this is a very uh, large, crowd today. We have allowed people in beyond the capacity of this room. We're not going to have any demonstrations of any kind. Uh, the next video the, is by the group Twisted Sister, and we'll show you a brief a portion of that. These are very popular videos. What followed was the music video for We're Not Gonna Take It by Twisted Sister, which was also halted at the guitar solo. Mr. Chairman, I think uh, Picture's worth a thousand words. This issue is too hot not to cool down. Parents are asking for assistance. And I hope we always remember that no success in life would compensate for failure in the home. Senator Hawkins, thank you very much. The next persons to testify were the four main founders of the PMRC, Susan Baker, Chipper Gore, Pam Hauer, and Sally Nevius. The outrageous edge of rock and roll has shifted its focus from Elvis's pelvis to the saw protruding from Blackie Lawless's codpiece on a Wasp album. There is a new element of vulgarity, violence, and brutality to women that is unprecedented. We are asking the recording industry to voluntarily assist parents who are concerned by placing a warning label on music products inappropriate 
for younger children due to explicit sexual or violent lyrics. Now, Mr. Chairman, one point we've already made, the material which has caused the concern is new and different. It's not just a continuation of controversies of past generations. To illustrate this point, we would like to show a slide presentation. And to this end, I turn the microphone over to Jeff Ling, who is a consultant to our group, and he will show you some of the material that we're talking about. Mr. Chairman, if we could have the lights turned down within the... All right. Today, the element of violence, brutal erotica, has exploded in rock music in an unprecedented way. This is Steve Boucher. Steve is dead. While listening to ACDC shoot to thrill, Steve fired his father's gun into his mouth. Jeff Ling's slideshow initially ran ahead of his presentation, as the projector used was at first set to automatically advance the slides. Ozzy Osbourne, on his first solo album shown here, sings a song called Suicide Solution. We got ahead of ourselves there. I'm sorry, here we go. Do me a favor, I think we want an automatic there. If you'll, that little knob at the bottom, if you'll run that back toward the back. No, I'm sorry, back toward the back of the projector. Okay. No, the one below that. Run that back to the back. There you go. I think we got on automatic. My apologies. This is the cover of an album entitled Rise of the Mutants by the band Impaler. Notice the man with the bloody meat in his mouth and hand is kneeling over the bloody arm of a woman. This is the cover of the album Stack Attack by the band Wrathchild. The back cover of this album, which is available to young children in record stores, included this photo of a nude woman on the back of the album. A song on an earlier album called Cock Rock Shock said the words, we're gonna fuck you and oh you fucking little bitch. The Rolling Stone on their album Undercover also sang a sadomasochistic activity in the song Tie You Up, The Pain of Love. You dream of it, passionate. You even get a rise from it. Feel the hot cum dripping on your thigh from it. Why so divine, the pain of love? Some artists take their pornographic rock to the stage. This is a picture of Wendy O. Williams in concert. Concerts that young adolescents can attend. How bad can it get? The list is endless. This album was released just recently by a band called The Mentors. The album includes songs like 4F Club, Finder, Feeler, Fucker, and Forgetter, Free Fix for a Fuck, Clap Queen, My Erection is Over, and the song Golden Showers, which says these words, Listen, you little slut, do as you are told. Come with daddy for me to pour the gold. Golden showers, all through my excrements you shall roam. Bend up and smell my anal vapor. Your face is my toilet paper. On your face I leave a shit tower. Golden showers. Mr. Chairman, right, that concludes Mr. my Lang, remarks, I'm, and I thank you. I'm sorry your time has expired. <laughs> the next witness to testify was Frank Zappa, accompanied by his attorney, Larry Stein. My name is Frank Zappa. This is my attorney, Larry Stein. He began by asking for clarification on whether or not legislation was being considered. This is one senator that might be interested in legislation and or regulation. Mm -hmm. So if it'll help you out in your testimony, uh, I might join Senator Hollings and, uh, or others in some kind of legislation and or regulation unless the free enterprise system, uh, both the producers and you as the performers, uh, See fit to clean up your act. Okay, thank you. Then I, hardly voluntary. Okay, so that's hardly voluntary. The PMRC proposal is an ill-conceived piece of nonsense which fails to deliver any real benefits to children, infringes the civil liberties of people who are not children, and promises to keep the courts busy for years dealing with the interpretational and enforcemental problems inherent in the proposal's design. In law, First Amendment issues are decided with a preference for the least restrictive alternative. In this context, the PMRC demands are the equivalent of treating dandruff by decapitation. <laughs> Taken as a whole, the complete list of PMRC demands reads like an instruction manual for some sinister kind of toilet training program to housebreak all composers and performers because of the lyrics of a few. Ladies, how dare you? The ladies' shame must be shared by the bosses of the major labels who, through the RIAA, chose to bargain away the rights of composers, performers, and retailers in order to pass H.R. 2911, the blank tape tax. While the wife of the Secretary of Treasury recites, gonna drive my love inside you, and Senator Gore's wife talks about bondage, an oral sex at gunpoint on the CBS Evening News, people in high places work on a tax bill that is so ridiculous, the only way to sneak it through is to keep the public's mind on something else. Porn rock. 
The establishment of a rating system, voluntary or otherwise, opens the door to an endless parade of moral quality control programs based on things certain Christians don't like. What if the next bunch of Washington wives demands a large yellow J on all material written or performed by Jews in order to save helpless children from exposure to concealed Zionist doctrine? D. Snyder would later state that he believed that Zappa hurt their cause by delivering his statement with such sarcasm and condescension. I have no objection to having all of the lyrics placed on the album routinely, all the time. But there is a little problem. Record companies do not own the right automatically to take these lyrics because they're owned by publishing companies. So just as all the rest of the PMRC proposals would cost money, this would cost money too, because the record companies would need, they, they shouldn't be forced to bear the cost of the extra expenditure to the publisher to print those lyrics. I think that that should at least be considered, and the idea of imposing these ratings on live concerts, on the albums, uh, asking record companies to reevaluate or drop or um, violate contracts that they already have with artists, should be thrown out. And that's it all. That's all I have to say. Senator Gore. I found your statement very interesting. And uh, let me say, although I disagree with some of the statements that you make and have made on other occasions, I have been a fan of your music, believe it or not. And I, I uh, respect you as a true original and, and a tremendously talented uh, musician. Occasionally, you give the impression that you think parents are just silly to, to be concerned at all. First of all, I think it is the parents' concern, it is not the government's concern. Yeah, they agree with you on that. Well, that doesn't come across in the way they have been speaking. The whole drift that I've gotten, based on the media blitz that has attended the PMRC and its rise to infamy, is that they have a special plan, and it has smelled like legislation up until now. There are too many things that look like hidden agendas involved with this, and I'm a parent, I've got four children. I want them to grow up in a country where they can think what they want to think, be what they want to be, yeah. and not what somebody's wife or somebody in government makes them be. I don't, yeah. want, I don't want to have that, and I don't think you do either. Okay, I've run out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Zappa, I uh, am astounded at the uh, courtesy and soft voice uh, nature of the comments of my friend, the senator from Tennessee. I can only say that I found your statement to be boorish, uh, <clears throat> incredibly and uh, insensitively insulting to the people who were here previously, that you could manage to give the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States a bad name if I felt that you had the slightest understanding of it, which I do not. You don't have the slightest understanding of the difference between government action and private action. And uh, you have certainly destroyed any case you might otherwise have had with this senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is this private action? Yeah, I must uh, confess that I never heard any of your music to my novel. I, I would be more than happy to recite my lyrics to you. <laughs> you, you probably never heard of the Mothers of Invention. I have heard uh, of uh, Glenn Miller and Mitch Miller. Did you ever perform with them? As a matter of fact, I took music lessons in uh, grade school from Mitch Miller's brother. That's the first sign of hope we've had in this <laughs> So if I understand you, you're, you're, you would be in support of printing uh, the lyrics, but you are adamantly opposed to any kind of a rating system. Is I'm that correct? I'm opposed to the rating system because, as I said, if you put a rating on uh, the, the record, it goes directly to the character of the person who made the record. Whereas if you rate a film, a guy who is in the film has been hired as an actor, he's pretending, you rate the film, whatever it is, it doesn't hurt him. Say so you have four children? Yes. Pardon me? Four children. Four children. Have you ever purchased toys for those children? No, my wife does. Well, I might tell you that if you were to go in a toy store, which is very educational for fathers, by the way, it's not a maternal a responsibility to buy toys for children, that you may look on the box, and the box says this is suitable for five to seven years of age. 
or 8 to 15 or 15 and above to give you some guidance for a toy for a child. Do you object to that? In a way, I do. Because that means that somebody in an office someplace is tell making a decision about how smart my child is. I'd be interested to see what toys your kids ever had. Why would you be interested? Just as a point of interest in this. Uh, well, come on over to the house. I'll show them to you. <laughs> Really? I, I might do that. <laughs> Have you ever made, do you make a profit from uh, sales of rock records? Yes. Thank you. I think that statement tells the story to this committee. Thank you. Mr. Zappa, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Zappa was followed by John Denver. When John Denver was coming in there to testify, nobody knew what he was going to say. And I know all the senators had their fingers crossed that he was going to be on their side. These hearings have been called to determine whether or not the government should intervene to enforce this practice. Mr. Chairman, this would approach censorship. May I be very clear that I am strongly opposed to censorship of any kind in our society or anywhere else in the world. I've had in my experience two encounters with a sort of censorship. Uh, my song, Rocky Mountain High, was banned from many radio stations uh, as a drug-related song. This was obviously done by people who had never seen or been to the Rocky Mountains and also had never experienced the elation, the celebration of life, or the joy in living that one feels when he observes something as wondrous as the Perseid meteor shower. Obviously a clear case of misinterpretation. Mr. Chairman, what assurance have I that any national panel to review my music would make any better judgment? Mr. Chairman, the suppression of a people or of a society begins, in my mind, with the censorship of the written or spoken word. It was so in Nazi Germany, it is so in many places today where those in power are afraid of the consequences of an informed and educated people. I'm a father of two children, both adopted. I have a lot of friends in the music business, uh, other rock performers who have children also. And all of them, including myself, we have a great concern for our children. That's, that's why I'm here today. In my experience, sir, all over the world, one of the most interesting things about the music that, that young people are listening to is it gives us, as adults, a very clear insight as to what is going on in their minds. The people that I've had the opportunity to talk with, what they express to me is a real frustration in their lives, an inability to understand or to envision any kind of a possible future because of the nuclear threat that we live under. They don't see things getting better economically. They do not see a future for themselves. It is my opinion that it is out of this that some young people put a gun into their mouths and pull the trigger. We can turn this around, sir. We can address the reality of a problem and not deal with just the symptoms and create not only a better world for our children, but for ourselves and all of humanity. We can learn to live together as human beings, living the example of peace and harmony among all people. John, thank you very much for your excellent statement. It's an honor to be able to ask uh, some questions. I've been a fan for a long time, Mr. Denver, and not only of your music, but also of uh, your uh, contributions to efforts like Farm Aid at the present time and also uh, world peace and uh, your trips to the Soviet Union and elsewhere. Do you agree that there does seem to be a growing trend uh, that uh, emphasizes uh, uh, explicit uh, violence and sex and uh, sadomasochism and the rest? Why do you think that has been growing in popularity? My experience, not only in this country, but all over the world, is that music today is the medium which most specifically tells us what's going on in young people's minds. Well. I mean, if a 10-year-old uh, listens to uh, a song uh, glorifying a rape, that's not uh, reflecting what is in that 10-year-old's uh, mind, is it? Uh, I don't think so. I'm not sure that there are many 10-year-olds who know what rape is. Well, uh, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure I would agree with that. And your basic line is that you're against any type of government action in this area, or indeed, any voluntary labeling? I, I would be, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. John, thank you very much.
very much. Thank you, Senator. Great privilege to be with you all. Thank you. Next we have uh, Mr. D. Snyder, the Twisted Sister, Free Fall Talent Group. What? Not the Twisted Sister? Yep. That's the group. Oh, this is one of the people who are. Now I'm there in my cut-off denim, my skin-tight jeans, my snakeskin boots, and my big hair. And I ain't getting dressed up for nobody. I'm a dirtbag and I'm proud. And I play in these people like, you know, I have got my speech in my back pocket, which I have worked on for a few weeks and honed and refined till it's a freaking nuclear weapon. Fold it up like a bad kid bringing his homework to school. You know, when I open it up and I'm flattening it out on the table and they're going, oh man, this is a lamb being brought to the slaughter. Mr. Snyder, thank you for being here. My name is D. Snyder, that's S-N-I-D-E-R. I'd like to tell the committee a little bit about myself. I'm 30 years old, I'm married, I have a three-year-old son. I was born and raised a Christian, and I still adhere to those principles. Believe it or not, I do not drink, I do not smoke, and I do not do drugs. I do play in and write the songs for a rock and roll band named Twisted Sister that is classified as heavy metal. And I pride myself on writing songs that are consistent with my above-mentioned beliefs. Since I seem to be the only person addressing this committee today who has been a direct target of accusations from the presumably responsible PMRC, I would like to use this occasion to speak on a more personal note and show just how unfair the whole concept of lyrical interpretation and judgment can be and how many times this can amount to little more than character assassination. Ms. Gore claimed that one of my songs, Under the Blade, had lyrics encouraging sadomasochism, bondage, and rape. The lyrics she quoted have absolutely nothing to do with these topics. On the contrary, the words in question are about surgery and the fear that it instills in people. As the creator of Under the Blade, I can say categorically that the only sadomasochism, bondage, and rape in this song is in the mind of Ms. Gore. I'm tired of running into kids on the street who tell me that they can't play our records anymore because of the misinformation their parents are being fed by the PMRC on TV and in the newspapers. It is my job as a parent to monitor what my children see, hear, and read during their preteen years. The full responsibility for this falls on the shoulders of my wife and I because there is no one else capable of making these judgments for us. Parents can thank the PMRC for reminding them that there is no substitute for parental guidance, but that is where the PMRC's job ends. I'd like to thank the committee for this time, and I hope my testimony will aid you in clearing up this issue. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. No. Can I get a glass with some water, please? Thank you. Yeah, yeah you're a cameraman. You can do it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Excuse me, are you going to tell me you're a big fan of my music as well? No, I'm not, uh, I'm not a fan of I'm your sorry, music. I'm sorry, Mr. Gore. Mr. Snyder, uh, what is the name of your fan club? The fan club is called the SMF Friends of Twisted Sister. And uh, what does SMF uh, stand for when it's uh, spelled out? It stands for the Sick Motherfucking Friends of Twisted Sister. Is this uh, also a Christian group? Uh, I don't believe that profanity has anything to do with Christianity. It's just an interesting uh, choice for, um, because I was getting the impression from your presentation that you were a very wholesome uh, kind of uh, performer. You say your song, Under the Blade, is uh, about surgery. Have you ever had uh, surgery with your hands tied and your legs strapped? I said it was about the fear of operations. I think people imagine being helpless on a table, the bright light in their face, the blade coming down on them, and having no totally afraid that they may wake up, who knows, dead, handicapped. It's a certain fear of hospitals. In my imagination, what I see the hospitals like. Is there a reference to the hospital in the song? No, there isn't, but there isn't a reference to a woman, sadomasochism, or bond oh, bondage, yes. I'm so it's not uh, really a, uh, a wild uh, leap of the imagination to, uh, uh, to jump to the conclusion that that's about something other than uh, 
surgery or hospitals, uh, neither of which are mentioned in the song. Uh, people can interpret it in many ways. Uh, Ms. Gore was looking for sadomasochism and bondage, and she found it. Someone looking for surgical references would have found it as well. Yeah. Quite possibly due to Snyder's comments about his wife, Senator Gore took a noticeably more aggressive stance against him over the previous two musicians. Let's suppose the lyrics aren't uh, printed. Then what choice does a parent have? To sit down and listen to every song on the album? Well, if they're really concerned about it, I think that they have to. Do you think that's so reasonable to uh, expect parents to do that? Being a parent isn't a reasonable thing. It's a very hard thing. I'm a parent and I know. In the, the vehemence with which you attacked um, uh, Senator Gore's wife, I detected sort of a defensiveness some, somehow on your part. Why did you feel it necessary to attribute uh, some of the qualities to her that you did? Why, why was that important to your testimony? First of all, I wasn't attacking Senator Gore's wife. I was attacking a member of the PMRC. Okay, I was two... Senator Gore's wife by name. So her name is Tipper Gore, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, I didn't say the senator's wife, I said Tipper Gore, okay? Secondly, defensive, I've been working very hard. I believe in the music I play. I pride myself on writing lyrics that are not offensive and that are saying something positive. Most of my songs are about personal freedom. So when someone says there's a song about sadomasochism and bondage, or someone says we're not going to take it, is violent lyrical content, which is what it's been rated for. Yes, I'm defensive. Yes, that gets me angry. Mr. Snyder, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. He was followed by National PTA Legislative Activity Vice President Millie Waterman, who touched on historical music controversy concerning its suggestive nature and clarified the organization's stance concerning the proposed rating system. That the National PTA in no way would encourage or support censorship, but we are asking that warning labels be voluntarily placed upon uh, the package and it be undertaken by the music industry themselves. She was followed by Stanley Gordikov himself. On future releases containing explicit lyrics, recording companies individually will include a packaging in inscription that will state, parental guidance, explicit lyrics. This will highlight such content for any concerned parent to exercise discretion. We will not rate the 25,000 new recorded songs we release each year as originally requested by the PMRC. Child supervision is my personal parental responsibility. I certainly would not be content to assign any part of my responsibility to some outside surrogate, like a record company, a radio station, a censorship panel, a government body, or a parent organization. Thank you. Well, I have a couple. No, no, we, we're not gonna have applause. When confronting Gordikov, Senator Danforth strongly sided with the PMRC's argument. I can't blame them for being a little bit wary about the motives of record companies that are right now making their profits by peddling uh, uh, lyrics that glorify rape and incest and drugs and suicide and violence to children. Why should they feel that that's any great custodian of the values of their kids? Yeah, but on the, on the other hand, they are not saying that those that the content of records should be changed. They're only asking that they be identified. They're, they're, yes, and they're, but they're asking that somebody assume responsibility for identifying them, and I don't think that there's much basis for feeling that the record companies are terribly responsible. After Gordikov was Dr. Joe Stusi of the University of Texas, who discussed the psychological effects of music listening. Today's heavy metal music is categorically different from previous forms of popular music. It contains the element of hatred, a meanness of spirit. I know personally of no form of popular music before which has had as one of its central elements the element of hatred. I hope that this committee will find a way to send a message to the industry. Clean up your act or we will do it for you. In the words of the heavy metal band Twisted Sister, we're not going to take it anymore. After him was Dr. Paul King, a child psychologist. Nearly all of my patients worship heavy metal music. Heavy metal portrays the power, power and glory of evil. Adolescents with emotional and or drug problems, which I treat every day, become further involved in delinquent behavior, violence, acts of cruelty, and Satan worship. The glamorization of violence, sex, and drugs leads to further problems with directing young people's attitudes. The final speakers were a panel representing broadcasters from across America. All in our industry now know that there is a problem which needs to be addressed and that they must make a conscientious decision about how to respond to the concerns about porn rock 
as they go about serving their audiences and their respective communities. Ladies and gentlemen, what we have today is to consider what is practical, what is reasonable, what creates the highest benefit for the real world and society as a whole. What we need on the issue of pornographic rock is a consumer information thrust which gives the National Music Review Council the opportunity to review every piece of contemporary music before it enters the American marketplace and label that music as acceptable or not. Will record companies be required to label all types of music, rock, jazz, classical, soul, country, and patriotic? Will older as well as newer material be covered? We look forward to the day when we see a violence or sex label on a Frank Sinatra record because it contains Mac the Knife or Strangers in the Night. Then we will believe that this isn't an attempt to put down currently popular music. The songs complained of today represent a very, very small fraction of all popular music currently being produced. And by highlighting just a small percentage of that music as explicit or needing of parental guidance is only going to serve to unduly focus attention on these subjects, I, I believe. That concludes a five-hour hearing. On October 30th, 1985, the Home Audio Recording Act received a committee hearing before the Senate. Senator Al Gore was listed as one of the bill's sponsors. After a few more hearings, the bill was ultimately rejected. Just two days later, on November 1st, the RIAA, National PTA, and PMRC reached a consensus on what would be voluntarily printed on albums featuring explicit lyrics. The warning was altered from the original parental guidance explicit lyrics to explicit lyrics parental advisory. We are pleased to announce here today that our three organizations have reached a mutually acceptable understanding after periodic discussions that span several months. Record companies would hereafter design their own warning labels containing this exact phrase or a slight variation thereof. After the agreement, the three organizations agreed to monitor the situation for one year and assess the results of the new labeling system. According to Tipper Gore, she considered 5% of the total records sold to be objectionable to the PMRC. However, due to the lax nature of the agreement and the low number of explicit records produced, only a minuscule number of albums received parental advisory stickers over the year following its inception. Additionally, some albums containing graphic content were released on independent labels that weren't members of the RIAA, thusly excluded from the agreement. On December 10, 1986, the PMRC denounced the RIAA in a press conference for allegedly failing to comply with their agreement, and sent another spurt of letters to record companies, complaining that the warning stickers were too small and only made it more difficult to control explicit releases. In 1990, under burgeoning pressure from 19 states who were discussing legal requirements and censorship bills, a new, more definitive consensus was reached, which established a standardized black and white design and size of the warning label. It was to be displayed in the lower right corner of explicit releases and would either be affixed to the record sleeve, compact disc or cassette cases, or alternatively could be printed as part of the original artwork. We don't think that the government should determine what our children listen to. And I mean that as an artist and also as a parent. And we also think that the label is cute. The first release to feature this new warning label was banned in the USA by rap group The Two Live Crew. After some further hearings, the warning sticker was reworded to say parental advisory explicit content in 1996. This design has remained to this day. In 2011, the labeling system was first introduced into the digital music market. Albums as well as individual tracks containing explicit lyrics are now displayed alongside standardized explicitness warnings. For the past 20 years or so, under the suggestion of the RIAA, voluntary labeling of records distributed in the United States that contain strong language or depictions of violence, sex, or substance abuse to such an extent as to merit parental notification has been practically mandatory. The effects of the warning label have often been debated. Some have acknowledged that the parental advisory sticker often encouraged younger audiences into buying an album branded with what is sometimes colloquially referred to as a tipper sticker. The forbidden fruit effect was confirmed by bands like Motley Crue, Quiet Riot, and Poison among which. The sticker itself became somewhat of a symbol of rebellion. 
it became most associated with the rap and hip hop genres. So much so that Greg Beto of Reason Magazine noted that the merit of hip hop albums lacking the parental warning label would be called into question. In a sense, rap took over the reins from heavy metal as the genre of music the parents feared would corrupt their children. Negative effects due to labeling were also witnessed. Joanne McDuffie, the singer for the Mary Jane Girls, which were featured on the Filthy 15, claimed that the parental advisory label prevented the group from being considered for music industry awards or from topping the charts. Blackie Lawless of Wasp confessed that as a result of the exposure he received due to the PMRC's efforts, he was subjected to some unwelcome encounters from the public, such as death threats and even vehicular sabotage. The music and dance TV show American Bandstand refused to allow Sheena Easton to perform her hit song Sugar Walls due to the controversy it had caused. Some major retailers, like Walmart for instance, refused to stock explicit albums, thusly potentially reducing the total number of explicit albums available for purchase. As for the PMRC, their influence progressively waned throughout the 80s and 90s. They are still active at an incredibly diminished capacity and have been so ever since PMRC co-founder Tipper Gore stepped down from her post in 1992 when she became the second lady of the United States. Despite their veritable obsolescence, the PMRC's historical influence on the music industry has not been forgotten, as many artists, particularly those in the punk, rap, and hip-hop genres, have addressed Tipper Gore and the PMRC in their music in the most unkind light. Due to its prominence in the music industry, the parental advisory label has veritably become a necessary evil and has not prevented certain artists from reaching mainstream popularity or expressing themselves in more and more explicit ways in the slightest. The songs reflect what's going on with society. Let's just say that if you think the lyrics are uglier today, look around you. The world is uglier than it was in 1950. And I think that if you find lyrics objectionable in songs and you find that the material is harsh and you can't take listening to it, maybe the better way to fix it is to fix your world and then these guys who write songs won't keep reminding you of how ugly stuff really is. <laughs>